Welcome to the B2B Growth Marketer Podcast. My name is Alex, your host, and today I'm with Tom Hunt, the founder of Fame and Bcast. Tom, welcome. Alec, thank you so much for having me. Yeah, and today, uh, you know, obviously you're heavily involved in in podcasts as your two companies that you've that you founded and co-founded are very, very heavily involved in that. You seem to be on a B2B side. So I thought today, um, as this kind of podcast revolution started during, you know, launched uh, heavily during the pandemic. I don't think it started during the pandemic, but kind of talk about some of the shifts in B2B marketing um, and where you kind of see things see things going as you've had a long career in, in, in kind of leading marketing teams and now two companies that help marketers market better. So maybe just to start, uh, like, obviously there's been some shifts in, in B2B marketing and strategy and is there is there like an origin for some of these shifts or is there like a i mean besides the big elephant in the room of the pandemic is there anything else that's caused these shifts in in like how we're marketing yeah yeah so my my thoughts are like they're going to be like random thoughts that i haven't got like a full cohesive theory yet and i was trying to think about this today like why is this thing changing and i think <laughs> the answer is actually quite obvious and it's the thing that's been changing almost every industry in the whole world since I guess it was first conceived in like the early 1990s. And it's the internet <laughs> and it's the flow of information. And so the question is, what impact is that, ha- is that having on the world of B2B buying or B2B marketing? And earlier today, I was like, I think there's no, like, you can't get away with stuff you used to be able to get away with because the flow of information, like, Everybody can know everything because yeah. information flow on the internet has been kind of, I don't know, democratized. And so if you were like you used to be calling a thousand companies a day and annoying 30% of them, then previously when there wasn't like review sites, communities, LinkedIn, then like people would get annoyed with you, but then that wouldn't spread, right? <laughs> but now if you're pissing off 300 of your ideal customers a day, that's going to stunt your growth. And yeah. so I think that is changing the way we have to market in B2B. Yeah. Yeah. Before it was siloed, you know, like Bob and accounting at a company in California couldn't go complain about uh, who called them from New York, trying to sell them some software or whatever they're selling. And so now exactly. that's interesting to think of. So talk about the internet because the internet, it's not a new thing, uh, but it's certainly evolving of how we, how we interact with the internet, I think has been evolving in the last uh, couple of years, definitely, definitely sped up by the pandemic. So what, what do you see like behaviors changes, behavioral changes in the internet? Yeah, so my, I read a few books about the history of the internet. I think web one was when we were first able to like, it, it was either like just see stuff on web pages or we're actually able to like put stuff into web pages. I think so yeah. maybe like commenting on blogs, right? That was web one. Yeah. Like web zero, static web page. Web two, we can comment on blogs. Um, sorry, web one, we can comment on blogs. Web two is like this more immersive social experience. And I think we're just like reaching the pinnacle of this, right? And that the the over the past, really, I would say five to 10 years is when web two has really taken off. And that has been the thing that's really impacting B2B now, because you can go on LinkedIn, get seven recommendations for your next like B2B yeah. marketing software provider. Um, then we, I, we're obviously not going to dig into web three because no one really knows what that's going to do, especially <laughs> to B2B marketing. So let's not go there because that's a whole other episode. That was my next question. Um, you, knew I, you knew that was coming. <laughs> Yeah, I really don't like. I've um, uh, haven't really committed any thought to how Web three is going to impact B two B marketing. But in like three years, once I start thinking about that, Alex, we can have another episode. Great, great. So if we're at the so, do you think if we're at the pinnacle of Web two? I mean, are, are like, is there anything for those for those B two B marketers out there? What can they do now? to still capture some of some of this kind of like social interaction, some of this like LinkedIn, I mean, you know, new apps uh, and products like Clubhouse, the rise and fall of Clubhouse, um, podcast, he's like, what, where, like, even within like a web 2.0, 
there's got to there's got to be like a like a like a map even for that. So if we're still in it, what's what's left in this like web 2.0 for people to still utilize and get better at and still still get value out of. Yeah, for sure. And going back to the you know the cold calling pharma companies a day example, pissing off 30% of them. I think what companies, the best companies have been doing, maybe do a couple of case studies. Um over the past like three to five years is the opposite of that. Like yeah. trying to annoy nobody. And if so the, the opposite of annoying nobody is making everybody, even if they're not your target customers, like and trust you. Yeah. Because if you do that, ultimately they're going to make a like more educated decision of who they want to buy from. And then they're just going to come to your site because they hear it because somebody talked about you in like a community or in a slack group mm -hmm. um, and they're going to come to your site they're going to request a demo they're going to request a proposal and so that's the key it's like a mindset shift once you've mm -hmm. made that mindset sh shift then there are like tactical things or like tactical strategies we can go through um, but if you if you haven't made that shift in your head yet then it's just not going to work um, yeah. so I mean we can pick out a couple of examples of this if that's going to make it easier for our audience yeah give me an example yeah give me an example cool so i'm going to be a little bit self like aggrandizing here but one example is we have a, or i have a group called sas marketer it's a facebook group Eleven point seven thousand people yeah. on facebook in a group obviously like in the description i link to fame and because services related to that to those yeah. but i don't think i've ever pitched in that group i just Right, con like because I post like one thing every day yeah. on LinkedIn and in that group. That's never pitching. It, it might be like go and listen to this podcast episode, but it's never pitching. Yeah. Um, and the interesting thing is that I would say ninety percent of that group probably wouldn't ever be customers because their businesses are too small or yeah. they're like not even in SaaS. Um, but this, like, I still get people that either come from the group and come to work with us. Or I get people say they talked to somebody who's in our group yeah. and then they came to us. And yeah. so this is a, an example of instead of r calling people up and pitching and annoying them, actually yeah. trying to improve their lives or their careers yeah. so they like and trust us and then that eventually comes back. So it's almost like releasing yeah. control and just yeah. uh, relying on the good of the universe, which if, yeah. you, if you say that to a CFO, most CFOs <laughs> are going to tell you, tell you like you're an idiot. But the, <laughs> yeah. it's kind of the jump, the leap. You have to yeah. make. And certainly the challenge marketers face is like, we know, I think everybody knows by now, like that's a good strategy, but you still need metrics. You still need numbers. You still need to show improvement. So you like have this, like, mm. this like a uh, give and take this like tug of war between let's just what you're saying. Um, let's go be really helpful. Let's create content that we aren't trying to get someone to convert on. Let's just try to create something that's going to be valuable to them, help their careers. That's like a, just like a, Hey, try this trick or tip or whatever it is versus here's a thesis of why you should be podcasting and why fame and be cast are the best options. Um, you know, yeah. it's just something that's more of like more general, helpful, how, how to, how can uh, you just give that example? Like the CFO is like, okay, cool, but where's the revenue? Um, how do you play that? How do you play that game while also providing and getting that data to show results? Yeah, exactly. So the if if you're doing that stuff right, this content creation stuff right, then you will over a long enough time period have people coming to you, assuming you have a service that people actually want to buy your thing, right? And so the question is, we just have to go to the CFO and say that out of the 100 people that we sold last year, 17 yeah. of them said they listened to our podcast or they came from our Facebook group. And so the, it's quite a simple solution on your demo, request a demo, request proposal form, yeah, open text field, like where did you hear about us? Make your sure saving and analyzing that because some people might get it wrong as well. They might be like Google, yeah. but actually they, their friend told them about you. They Google you, then they come to you. So, um, yeah, I would say that's the most reliable way to prove to your CFO that this thing is working because no tech is going to tell you be able to tell you that they right. came from a Facebook group. Right.
And I feel like there's some uh, backlash on the attribution software out there because it's not capturing the, what we're talking about. It's not saying like, hey, this person came from our Facebook group or LinkedIn group or from our podcast. So are you um, are you at Fame or at Becast? I don't know if you have a sales process, if, you, if they talk to a salesperson or if it's a forum. Are you asking people at purchase like, hey, how'd you hear about us? This is a very, very topical question, Alex, because um, I should be, and I do. But my uh, at the same time, the other thing you need to do, it, I think, in B two B, is just like make your buying process, especially if you have people in the way of it, um, yeah, as smooth as you possibly can. And that's even to go to the extent like you don't say anything or ask any questions that's not, that are not going to further further the deal. Yeah. And so I have started doing it recently. Um, and I ask everyone that buys, obviously, but I'm trying to remove all blockers like that. Yeah. You're trying to make someone think right in the sales process yeah. where you really don't want them to. And so I think the right answer is probably yes to do that. But at the moment, I'm so concerned about like that conversion rate and making the buying yeah. process amazing that I haven't been saying that. Yeah. Well, you'll, I only bring that up because you you talk about that example of like, oh, they how do we how do you. How do you send your CFO, hey, the podcast is working. We are sending, we had, um, you know, out of the last quarter, five customers said they listen. Like is how you, how, how do we capture that data other than just asking the customers? Like, hey, how'd you hear a, about a, this? A, a free text field on the form. On like yeah. the request demo or the request proposal form. Um because if you think about it, if you're selling like a 100K a year thing um, yeah. and are you worried about conversion on that form, then if somebody is not willing to like <laughs> write that on the form, then yeah. they're definitely not going to go through the process of buying a 100K thing. Um, yeah. So I don't think it makes the buying process that that, more, that much more tricky. But I, I just don't, to be honest, most buyers don't care getting asked that question either. Yeah. But I, maybe I'm just a bit paranoid about it. So maybe yeah. I should just start asking everybody. Well, I mean, I think you have the right philosophy is like, let's make this as easy and smooth as possible. Mm. And once you know it works, you know, there's a philosophy either make, you know, add as much as you want. And if it's not working, start to remove things or just to start slowly adding things to see if it's going to cause, you know, a dip in conversions. Because that it's I think it's valuable. I think you see the value and I don't think you need to see the numbers to say that it's working for you, but there's a lot of companies out there. Um, if they're just going to start a B2B, they're going to start a podcast, targeting their customers to put the time and effort. It goes into, you know, it takes a lot of time to edit these things for people that don't have like editing backgrounds or, you know, team to do it. And so it is a time commitment to create podcasts. It's a lot easier than it used to be with tools like Riverside and other things like that, but it's still, Still commitment. So I think for a lot of companies to make that type of commitment, um, they need to be able to like show something for it other than, hey, we have uh, 30 new followers this month. Um, and like, you know, in some of these some of these podcasts, like that's the growth that they're getting because it's very niche. It's very, you know, in their space. So, you know, well, I guess like maybe let me frame the question this way. If there's a marketing director or marketing manager out there who's like being tasked to create more content and they're like doing their research. They're big podcasters. They love listening. What's like the advice? How would they get started? What's like a, what's like a way to go about that? Yeah. Getting started on the show. So step one, we want to convince our CEO to be the host. And, and the way you do that is to say, look, we're going to turn you into a, an interviewing machine you're only going to spend 45 minutes per episode we're going to prep you and we're going to put you on calls with our ideal customers ideal partners or just like really interesting people with big audiences in yeah. the space yeah. in our niche um so that's step one once you've done that you going to actually find the guests it's pretty easy on linkedin you just like write a nice yeah. message um say yeah. you love their stuff and then do you want to come on the show <laughs> um yeah. so that's step two Step three, as you get book that in, get the host to interview it. Step four, like if the budget's low, you can just find a, fr a freelancer to edit this. Um, yeah. For like not very much at all. 
at any yeah. release. So I, I like I think this actually happened. So fame started because well I, I got into B two B podcasting because we went through this exact process. Except <laughs> I was head of marketing at B two B SaaS company, and I wasn't the CEO, but I was the host. <laughs> and so I was like, team, can you like go and do this for me? And we started doing it, and like the first episodes were just horrendous, like really badly edited. Yeah. I think someone <laughs> yeah. in the team edited them right. Yeah. Um, and but the the real actual gift from that process was obviously we, we were like meeting a lot of people who were like good customers partners or had a big audience but it was like learning about that that customer persona so i think those are the like tactical steps to get started but i think before getting started it's useful to understand like why how this could be valuable for the company because mm -hmm. yes as we've talked about this whole episode we want to be creating information that's actually going to improve the lives of our customers that's great it takes a long time to start getting stuff to show the cfo though yeah and so what are the other ways we can convince the cfo or the ceo that this thing is going to be useful to do so how do we do that a we show the, like the amount of resources that it's going to take actually not that much because we can do most of ourselves and we can like get a freelance data yeah. tip for quite cheap number two is what are the other benefits so we're going to network we're going to meet these people who could be buyers they could be customers they, they could share our episodes because they've got a big audience um, and I actually think the hidden benefit is that you start to learn a lot about the industry and your customers and mm -hmm. potential customers. And so that's probably what I recommend is like looking at the other benefits. Because if it, the whole ethos behind fame, and if you get other benefits from the process, you're going to yeah. keep investing. And so you build an audience that they're actually going to give you an ROI. Yeah. Um, and so basically, the longer we can get a client to run the show, the more likely they are to stay. Yeah. And so that's important, I think. Yeah. Yeah. What is your... Um, I mean, like, as, as a fellow marketer and kind of like, uh, you know, B2B marketing agency, kind of we're in the same similar, similar space. What do you tell... You've got a you've got a prospect who's like, yeah, I want a podcast, but but realistically, Tom, how long is it going to take for me to see traction, traction on followers, traction on listeners, traction on people engaging, traction on people actually, you know, asking for our, inquiring about our services. Yeah, so I say that we wouldn't look for any ROI on the listener side for six months, and we're not going to pay any ads in. We're just going to focus on making awesome content for them, mm -hmm. while also building connections with people that have big audiences, partners, or customers. Yeah. And so then after six months, assuming it's a bi-weekly show, that's 12 relationships we would have built. Probably would have learned a lot about our potential customers, about the market. Um, and potentially some of those partners or customers would have moved into the sales funnel for us. And because we haven't put any ads in and we've been improving the content slightly every, every week or every month, the, the audience, though it may be small depending on the niche, will be growing. Mm -hmm. And at that point, we're going to start to, like, ideally, after, like, month eight or month nine, we check the inbound form, inbound demo requests in that free text field, and we're just hoping we're going to do a control F on that Google Sheet, and there's going to be the word podcast in there. Yeah. Um, yeah. We're not hoping, but it, like, I would be, I would, if I was a betting man, I would put <laughs> money on the fact that if you did this, if you executed this well for nine months, and you had a product that people actually want to buy, that um, you would have a number of of results for that for that search. Yeah, Hi, uh, you mentioned uh, you mentioned like biweekly. What what is like a frequency that you recommend? Is it is it worth doing if you're doing one a month? Is it worth doing? Do you need to do like one a week? One every you know two every two weeks? Yeah, so I it's similar to like going to the gym. So if you want to get a result, you you need to do more, <laughs> right? But only if only you only do more if you yeah. can like maintain the quality. Yeah. So the, the answer to that question is as frequent as possible where the quality is maintained. So that could be monthly. Yeah. The show is probably not going to grow that fast if it's monthly um, or it could be bi-weekly or it could be weekly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay, let's talk about uh, let's talk about the future. And since we've been talking a lot about podcasting and I think that is a big part of like what B2B companies can do. Um, so answer it either via podcast or just B2B in general. What is the next like 12 months, 18 months look like in like the B2B marketing space? Is there going to be a lot of change? Are we going to, are we going to be where we are now? What do you think? Yeah. So I, I think the trends we're seeing um, driven by 
the pinnacle of Web2 are going to retain. And so the way I like to measure this, if I can imagine our metric, but if you can have like, <laughs> <laughs> I call it's them positive kind. impression. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So not just an impression, like all the paid platforms gives you impressions, right? But we want positive impressions. So an impression that leave the person like with a better emotional connection to you. Than mm -hmm. And so what we need to do or what becomes even more important in the next year is getting these positive target positive impressions ideally targeted on people that could buy yeah uh, that's really what we want um because if we are doing the opposite of that if we're getting negative targeted impressions and we're actually annoying those people that could buy from us the yeah. like both of these are going to compound uh, like either way yeah. up or down and so yeah. i find it super interesting sometimes when a b2b company is running ads and they're, they're like the ad, these ads are just not working but then they've also been cold calling and not annoying people for the past three years and so <laughs> obviously people are not your ads are going to be shit because uh, I don't know yeah. your, your ads are going to be rubbish because you've annoyed the whole market over the past three years so it isn't that your ad copy is bad or your targeting is bad it's that no one likes you and so yeah. <laughs> this is this is what we need to start doing we need to start making people like us yeah so you uh, you don't seem to be a fan of uh, of like cold calling outbound, is that right? Yeah, <laughs> I guess it's because because I'm quite introverted, right? And so there is absolutely no way you're going to get me like cold calling people. I actually have my phone set to like you can't if it's an unknown number, it just doesn't ring. It doesn't so I just send ring. a notification. <laughs> yeah, yeah, because I'm just not doing that. So I'm obviously biased, right? I'm also set marketing, not sales, even though I've done all the sales for these businesses. So I'm like for sure I'm biased and probably outbound can maybe be done in a way that doesn't annoy people. I'm sure the best people are doing it can do it without annoying people. Um, so I wouldn't say I'm like against outbound, I'm like against annoying people. And so if yeah. you can work out a way to do outbound and not annoy people, then I'm, I'm for that. Yeah, yeah, I, I'm right there with you. Um, I am in sales, I lead our sales marketing and I nice. uh, call people. I, I don't, I don't do like, you? for the record, I do not like cold calling and I stopped doing it probably like three years ago. Cause I was like, I don't like it. I'd never answer my phone if I don't know the number. Um, I let it ring. If it's important, it goes to voicemail um, or they'll text me. Or if it's somebody I know, I'll call them back. Um, like there's mm -hmm. no need for me to answer my phone because 98% of it is either a cold call trying to sell me something I don't want or automated response mm -hmm. from a, <laughs> a scam IRS trying to get my, my tax info or something. So I, I, I'm with you. I don't, I don't, uh, I don't like cold calling as much. Cold emailing, I think, can be done in a way that is in the same philosophy. Like what you're talking about. Like how do we just, how do we just help you? How do we be? How do we leave a positive impact? I think it's like a good way to think of it. Is how do we leave a positive impact with people we interact with? Whether that's cold email, whether that's LinkedIn, you know, podcasts, all all the channels that we have as an agency our philosophy is like, how do we be helpful first? And then the, if it's a good opportunity, it'll come to, it'll come back. It'll come to us. Um, and through emails, we try more personalized, like let's be humans and connect. And mm -hmm. if you're not interested, that's fine. No, yeah. I'm not going to email you 30 times if you say no, or if you don't respond, because you clearly are not interested. Um, so I think I'm right there with you. Well, Tom, we're getting close. Quick question, um, Alex. Alex. Yeah. Alex, can I ask you a question about cold yes. calling? Yes. So yes. three years ago when you were like into it, let's say you did 100 dials in a day, how many of those people do you think had positive versus negative impressions? I'm assuming mostly positive because you're a really great guy. Um, mostly, mostly negative because here's the thing about mm. me when I cold call, I get really awkward and uncomfortable <laughs> and I don't talk, I don't talk like this. <laughs> And I go into it being like, I like jump, and I'm like, okay, be normal. <laughs> and then I and then they the answer was like, oh, this is Alex from B two B. Like I just, it's just soup. I get super anxious and stressed about mm. it. And uh, it's funny that I'm in sales and I can't handle a cold call. Yeah, yeah, okay, fair enough. So mainly negative. So hopefully uh, we, we didn't harm. Yeah, we didn't harm the brand too much. And you know what? I was not doing a hundred today. I was doing. 30 a week, 20 a week. It was okay. very targeted. So, um, and that's that stopped a while ago. <laughs> yeah, not too much damage uh, then. Yeah, hopefully it's all right. And we do other things. So hopefully we uh, share my good side more. Well, well this podcast, right? 
yeah like th- there are yeah. people out there that be like i really enjoyed that episode maybe i'm, I'm yeah. not i would never be a customer or i'm not going to buy right now but if like the, the universe is a good place at some point that's gonna it's gonna come back to you i have gotten we have gotten more work we've gotten a plenty of work from people who um changed jobs so like we knew them we they were like uh, I've got some like mastermind groups for marketers, not really in our audience and like came back two years later and it's like, hey, I'm now the head of marketing at this company and we're looking at HubSpot and nice. that's something we do. And so it's certainly uh, the universe. If you put the vi- if you put the right vibe out there, it will come back. Um, mm-hmm. And I think everyone's probably got examples of, you know, that kind of story um, as long as, as, as you are... <laughs> not being annoying and not being annoying. a jerk and it's not actually if like proven psychology like i agree with the vibe you want to be nice you want to have like high energy yeah. whatever but it's also like proven psychology it's called the law of reciprocity right if you help someone at yeah. some point they want to pay back the debt it's like we're biased to do that and so it, it yeah. makes total sense yeah yeah uh well i could probably talk to you for like another hour <laughs> this is fun um well hey we're almost out of time what i want to do is um where can people find you where do you want you know do you have a, i know you have a couple podcasts like what should you want people to check out um you know i would recommend people check out your website you guys do have this um i did notice you guys do have this uh kind of like podcasting course um mm, which i would yeah. recommend people check out completely free zero to 140,000 downloads um yeah no so in terms of me yeah just search tom handle on linkedin uh, connect me ask me any questions and then yeah i have a show where if i guess kind of similar vibe to this confessions of a b2b marketer um you can find in any <laughs> podcast directory i love that um a friend of mine ashley levesque started this uh support group it's called the marketer support group um <laughs> and we just talk about all the things that's like like, are we really, do, is this really a thing that we either have to do as marketers or like, uh, you know, oftentimes marketers always say, I'm also the, uh, I'm also the IT person at my company. Like, why am I the expert of Gmail? Cause your email is broken. <laughs> yeah. Um, like that's not what I know. Yeah. So, uh, I love that confessionals of a marketer. Uh, I love it. Well, Tom, thank you so much. This has been, this has been great. Awesome. Alex. No, thank you so much. I really enjoyed the chat. All right. Thanks.